The following program is made possible by the generous sponsorship of Crestcom Bank, serving our community and our veterans with full-service banking and convenient locations, and by Agape Senior Center, providing quality senior health care for our community and our veterans from residential locations in Conway and Garden City. From the campus of Coastal Carolina University, the Center for Military and Veteran Studies is pleased to present Military Memoirs. Hello and welcome to Military Memoirs. I'm Rod Gregg and our guest for this program is Reverend Paul Tompkins of Conway, South Carolina, who is a veteran of the Korean War and was also a prisoner of war during the Korean War. Uh, Pastor Tompkins, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you very much. You grew up in Horry County, South Carolina as a young boy in the 1930s and early 40s. What was that like? Hmm, it was hard. One street coming into Conway, that is Highway, that's Highway 701, came in uh, from Georgetown, went out to Loris. Rest of your streets were dirt streets. People worked for a very low income, no sidewalks, uh, very few lights in town, and uh, very few jobs. Well, you were the baby of seven children, and you told me that uh, uh, your parents uh, were sharecroppers. Who were your parents? Zeddie and Ben Tompkins. And uh, tragedy struck your family when you were a young boy. Yes, my, uh, my father had pneumonia, and he died, left mother with seven children, and uh, we had to move to town and try to find some work. Now, how did your mom in those days, in the 1930s, uh, manage to take care of seven children by herself? I don't know. We, uh, there was a sewing room in Conway, and she managed to get a job at the sewing room, and she took in washings, and uh, did house cleaning for other people. My sister did yard work and things of that nature. It was pretty hard. Well, did the children um, all work in one way or another? As soon as they got old enough, uh, President Roosevelt had uh, been elected in 1933, and he began to get some work involved in the counties and in the cities. And we had the CC camp, the WPA, and uh, the sewing room in our area. My, my brother, he joined the CC camp, and my sister, oldest sister, worked on the WPA. Now when you say the CCC, you're talking about the Civilian Conservation Corps, and uh, that was a New Deal program enacted by Congress and President Roosevelt during the Great Depression that uh, allowed young men, single young men, to, uh, to go to work making parks, building roads, uh, making things like Myrtle Beach State Park and the Blue Ridge Parkway and, and such as that. And, and uh, so they had plenty to eat, work to do, and then they sent home their money to the families. Uh, what do you remember about the CCC in Horry County, South Carolina? <clears throat> I remember very little about it, to be honest with you, except that later on I enjoyed the results <laughs> of it. But I remember very little about it. But well, your brother worked it in that. Yes, he, he worked in that. And your sister worked in the WPA, which was the Works Progress Administration, and that was, they did a lot of things, including uh, beautification programs and, and that sort of thing. That's, that's true. But you also had a job, and uh, it wasn't a government job, you were you were working in a bowling alley. Yes, sir, I was behind the pins. Now, where was this and what did you do? Well, 
where the Chevrolet place is now, Palmetto Chevrolet place in Conway, right across the street from it behind where the Methodist church is now, there was a bowling alley. And I worked there setting up pins until very late at night. Hmm. And how old were you at that time? Uh, I don't really know. I, I was in the fifth and the sixth grade. But uh, I had missed so many grades until it's hard to tell. So you, you were working really as a child? That's right. And how much money did you make as a pin boy in the bowling alley? I can't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> but every bit helped in those days. Every bit helped. So uh, <clears throat> you decided when you were uh, older, when you were a teenager, to go with, live with your brother in Georgetown, and you got a job there. You, you told me earlier working in the with International Paper Company in Georgetown. What was that like? That's true. Well, it was very different from what I had been used to. I never have made paper before, and we worked in a pulp mill. And uh, it was very interesting how we, we chipped up that pine and put it in a big baller, or a digester, they called it and mixed liquor and water with it and a certain amount of steam and it made pulp out of this wood. And then they would wash it out, wash the, wash the uh, uh, strong liquor out of it and they would process it and over in another plant they would make paper out of it. So it was very interesting to me. But it was also a a lot better job than being a pin boy. Oh yes, it paid a lot more too. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Well, how how did uh, how did families like yours uh, make everything work like that in those days? How did you keep everything together like you did? I wore everybody else's shoes and clothes, and uh, we had no more than one piece of meat a piece. And we eat a lot of beans and potatoes. And it was rough, but we stuck together and we made it. Although, later on, two of my brothers and one of my sisters had to go to Connor Maxwell Orphanage in mm -hmm. Greenwood. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just such a hard thing to think about your family splitting up like that. It was. Uh, we got to see them once a year. <clears throat> They got good clothes. They were taught manners. They uh, went to school. Matter of fact, my sister graduated from the high school at Connor Maxwell Orphanage, and they found her a job as working in the dentistry. And uh, she married in Columbia, South Carolina, raised her family there, and she made a good living. One of my brothers went in the Marine Corps and the other one stayed around Conway. And, uh, but it was hard coming up. Were there any lessons that you look back at? Anything you feel like that you learned living in, in, in those hard days in such a way? Well, I see families falling apart now. We have most anything we want. And uh, people don't seem to appreciate what they do have, and they have disrespect for other people, and they just don't seem to love God like people used to when I was a little boy and coming up. Things were a lot different about God than what it is now. Well, when you were growing up in, in Horry County in the, in the 1930s and then 40s, World War II was going on. Right. Um, and you were dealing with all these family struggles, um, and you knew this war was going on, but uh, you were too young for that. You missed it, but when it was over, um, and you were old enough, you, uh, you wanted to go into the service. Why is that? Well, there were some things that I needed in life, <clears throat> and I saw that out of my reach in the environment that I was in. And I thought maybe if I could get in service and travel, uh, get back in school, 
which I did do. I was going to school when I went to Korea. But that was my goal, was to graduate from school, enter into college, and get as much education as I possibly could. I knew that would help me. Well, and what you decided to do in 1948 was uh, enlist in the United States Army uh, three years after World War II ended. Why did you choose to do that? That was, uh, that was to get me out of my environment and also I uh, got my notice to register and I thought maybe if I, about the time I got settled down, maybe got married, that I would have to register and be drafted into service and be gone a couple of years and leave my wife. And I didn't want that. So I went ahead and volunteered for service and get my military time behind me and uh, do as well as I could while I was in there. Well, you enlisted in Conway and did your basic training, uh, you told me earlier, at Fort Jackson in Columbia. What was that like? That was very challenging, but it was right on my line. I loved that kind of life. I uh, guess it was the way I was raised, but uh, we enjoyed that kind of life. Matter of fact, the rifle was about as, the same weight of the gun that I had back home, and uh, I liked the, the hard type of life. So you were like a lot of those southern boys. You, you grew up hunting and fishing, and you were familiar with the outdoors. You were familiar with uh, firearms from hunting, and so you felt like that helped you make the transition into the military? Oh, yes. Yes, I was very familiar with the, with the ammo and the uh, weapon and uh, that kind of uh, camping out. I, I enjoyed it very much. Well, what about the physical demands of uh, boot camp? Well, I enjoyed that, too. It was no stranger to me. <laughs> I grew up with boys. <laughs> so you felt at home. I felt at you home. You felt at home. Well, you told me earlier that you, you left, uh, you, you volunteered, you wanted to be in the Airborne Corps, but something happened to stop that. Well, I caught pneumonia during basic training, and um, I had to go to the hospital for a week and miss my graduating class, and I would have had to wait for another cycle to come around, and I didn't want to wait that long there at Fort Jackson. So I signed a waiver, went to a school in Fort Eustis, Virginia, in ship rigging, and shipped out to Yokohama, Japan, in a transportation uh, school. Yeah, now, what did, what did a soldier in the Army have to do with uh, ship rigging? Uh, that sounds like a Navy chore. Well, Army had ships also. They, they, had, uh, they had troop ships and the type of work that we did was make cargo nets and uh, different type of halters and things of that nature. We learned to tie as many knots as the Navy did. We could make an hal a halter just like a sailor could. And we could make monkey fists and things that applied to the Navy just like they could right there for Eustis, Virginia. So you became sort of a, 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 a longshoreman or a Dovador, uh, knowing how to work the docks, how to unload and load cargo. That's right, we had stevedore training. Well, you found yourself in Japan, but not too long after you were in Japan, you found yourself in a, another very dangerous place, uh, Korea, as the Korean War began. And we're going to talk about that when we come back in just a moment. They're all around us. They're the men and women who served in our nation's armed forces. In good times and bad, they've been willing to stand in harm's way to preserve, protect, and defend the legacy of freedom we enjoy as Americans. All of them gave some, and some of them gave all. We owe them a lot. So the next time you see an American veteran, say thank you for all of us. Hello 
and welcome back to Military Memoirs. Our guest is the Reverend Paul Tompkins, who is a veteran of the Korean War and who was also a prisoner of war during that war. Uh, now, Pastor Tompkins, you were telling me earlier about growing up in Horry County uh, when things were very difficult and uh, going uh, at the end of World War II into the military and you found yourself being trained to work on docks unloading cargo ships for the Army and you were sent to Japan which was occupied by American forces at that time and, and that's where you were when the Korean War began. Do you remember your feelings when you heard that war had begun in Korea? Well I heard President Sigmund Rhee when he made his address to the country, to the nation really, pleading for help that North Korea had attacked and uh, he needed ammunition, arms, and I volunteered in my company. I had this type of training to uh, go at night and load ships. The uh, ammo depots were in Yokohama and we had the 1st Cavalry, 24th and 25th Infantry Divisions right close here. Matter of fact, the 1st Cavalry guard, guarded the palace, the Empress Palace in Tokyo, Japan. And uh, I volunteered for this service at night. Well, and to put this in context, uh, North Korea and South Korea were divided after World War II. North Korea became a communist state and uh, in 1950 invaded South Korea and the president you spoke of, president of South Korea, called for help and the United States uh, and other allies, Australia, New Zealand, other nations formed a force that went in to, uh, to battle the uh, invaders from North Korea and to drive them back in, into, uh, into that uh, country and it was a war that lasted uh, almost three years and uh, more than 30,000 American lives were lost in it. Now, you were in Japan when this all occurred, and, and I presume you could have stayed there loading cargo ships, but um, you volunteered to go to the front, to go into combat. Why did you do that? <coughs> well, I, um, I really thought of my duty in a way. I had the type of training I volunteered to go to Pusan to unload the ships that had the ammunition. The ships that we had loaded into in Japan and sent over there, they were still in the, in the, in the port, not unloaded. And our troops needed that ammunition at the front. And we were there in Pusan. We unloaded the uh, ammunition and all and we're sending it to the front. And we also helped load the uh, wounded people on the hospital ships. And when we saw all those GIs that were wounded, it really got to me. So I wanted to volunteer for the front. Well, you know, a lot of people might have had that same experience and, and seen wounded troops, and that might have made them want to do the, the opposite stay away from it. So what was it that you think about seeing American wounded troops that motivated you to go fight? Well, I don't think I was no more patriotic than anyone, but uh, I wasn't married. I had no one back home but my mother that depended on me or looked for me to return. And I didn't think about dying. I thought about defending my country and doing my part to help do what had to be done. And so that's why I volunteered. Well, you were in the Army's 243rd Transportation Company, you told me, when you were working with cargo ships. Yes, sir. And then when you volunteered, you, you found yourself in Company K of the 8th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division, as a rifleman. But this was not cavalry with horses. This was modernized cavalry with, with armor that moved moved infantry troops quickly. That's right. So you, you found yourself um, in combat in Korea pretty rapidly, didn't you? Yes, sir. When you volunteer, they really took you at your word. They uh, got us on the front line immediately. Matter of fact, we traveled by night 
and we uh, joined the fighting troops from Pusan to Tegu, and Tegu was where they were fighting at that time. And it was a fight from then on, every day. So you remember your uh, your first combat? Well, it was at night. What was that like? It it was horrifying. I'd never been in a battle in my life where they used real ammunition. And uh, it's not like watching it on television. You see John Wayne and how he's carrying on and, and doing things. Uh, we didn't have any John Waynes. We had a lot of men that were trying to dig foxholes, but we had a lot of men. We decided to head blown off. We had men that uh, were just laying on top of the ground and couldn't dig a foxhole, and they were blown open. We had people that you couldn't put a first aid on, and we had people that died trying, but that's all they could do. And I wasn't used to anything like that, but we adjusted. Well, how, how did you adjust to that, to that kind of horror? I really can't tell you, except that we know that if we didn't do our very best, we would probably be just like that. Mm -hmm. And that infuriated me to see our people torn apart as they were. And so I tried to be the best soldier that I could. You have to dig a foxhole and get in that foxhole. And you have to fight like you've been trained in basic training. That's what you have to do. Well, when you were engaged in, in combat in Korea, was normally, was, were you uh, in a defensive line and the North Koreans were taking the offensive and storming your line? Most time, most time. But I remember one time we had been pinned down for three days and uh, we had run out of water. We had run out of ammunition. We have had two airdrops to get our supplies in. <clears throat> and there were so many snipers shooting till we could hardly get the supplies. And uh, first lieutenant, he wanted uh, some volunteers to go and take this hill and knock that machine gun out. And uh, he said, by the way, there's a creek at the bottom of the, of the mountain. We'll be able to get some water. And we hadn't had any water in three days. I was one of the volunteers. We made it down to the bottom of the mountain and we got our canteen full of water. We drank all the water we want, and we took that hill. Mm -hmm. We went up that hill, I was a machine gun guard, and uh, wherever that machine gun went, I went. It was a 30 caliber air cool machine gun, and I stayed with him, and we went up that hill. Not only me, but I hope a tomb, or our volunteers. We went up that hill and we took that hill, not that machine gun nest out that had been holding our company down. And uh, that's where I was telling you about where I was laying down. There was three of us in a row. And I got up and shook the other two guys and both of them were dead. That was the closest I've ever come as I know of to getting killed. Well, some of this combat was um, it was very close, almost hand-to-hand -hand in places. Yes, sir. But we, I never did do any hand-to-hand -hand combat. I never did. What kind of combat soldier uh, was the North Korean soldier? The North Korean was not a real good fighting soldier. I don't think he had real good training. I think he would have been better had he have had the training. He had the equipment. But uh, I think that counts most of all is the training that a man's got and how that he can be productive in producing that training. If you'll not lose his head, but remember what he did in basic training and what he learned in basic training, well, he'll be a much better, a much better soldier. But there were just so many of the North Koreans, they could uh, they could make up in numbers what they, in many ways, maybe what they like, lacked in training. Yeah, they would have these sacky parties before they had a rig. You could tell when they were going to pull a bonsai. bonsai. They'd be down at the bottom of the mountain, they'd have a sacky party, they'd get about drunk, and here they would come screaming bonsai. And we'd roll down grenades on them, and 
and shoot mortars on them and stay up all night shooting rifle fire. It was almost like a massacre sometimes. But uh, it seemed like they just didn't have any feelings. But they were good fighters in a way. What were your feelings when you realized that uh, you were in this and the reality of it and that you were going to, that you were killing people? Well, I knew it was either me or it was them. I knew they were soldiers just like I was. And I never shot anyone that, that surrendered. I never did. But uh, he was trying to kill me just like I was trying to kill him. Well, you were involved in the uh, Inchon invasion, and then you found yourself facing uh, a new enemy when Communist China entered the Korean War and poured uh, hundreds of thousands of troops into those lines in Korea. Um, do you remember when you were first engaged with Chinese troops? We were up on, we had won the war, really, in Korea. It was, it was in November. We had fought all the way from Tegu to the Yale River from September to November. When I was coming in, our, uh, we still had on summer clothes. Our clothes couldn't catch us. We were moving so fast. Our supplies were about to run out. And we were pulling uh, patrol up on the, the China border. And one night we saw these torches that were lit up and could hear people blowing buglers. And uh, our company commander give word to us not to follow them. That was Chinese, and we were not at war with them. But there was four armies over there, and we had one battalion of men. And when they did come through, they, uh, they marched right through us. So your initial orders were to hold your fire because uh, you, you, the United States and the other nations in Korea weren't That's engaged true. in warfare with the Chinese at the time, but then the Chinese attacked. That's true. Whenever they attacked us and started killing the men, then they'd give us the word to the command to attack. And they rolled over your line because there were just so many of them? Oh, yes. we. I never seen so many soldiers in my life. We, we didn't. You could shoot and it would come right on. There were so many of them. And finally our company commander gave us word to uh, retreat and try to make it back to our outfit. But <clears throat> in the process of that, we were captured. Well, you were uh, a prisoner of war held by the Chinese communists for um, 34 months. 34 months. 34 months. And, and that is in itself is another story which we want to deal with in a, in a later interview. Um, you came back, but you survived, thankfully, that uh, imprisonment uh, in uh, the Korean War and it's under the uh, rule of the Chinese Communists, and you came back to the United States, were discharged. You uh, married Riddell Marlowe of Ulrey County, had four children, two boys, two girls, seven grandchildren, five great-grandchildren, and to date, uh, you're looking at being married 60 years. Uh, worked in the paper mill for a while and then eventually felt a call to the ministry and spent 50 years as a pastor, lastly at Souls Harbor Church in Conway, South Carolina. Uh, that's a remarkable life, a remarkable career, and you're 84? 84. And going strong. <laughs> well, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for your service and uh, for what you, um, what you did for us and, and for our country and what you were willing to do. And I want to thank you so much for coming here and sharing that with us today on this program. You're certainly welcome. And we want to thank you, too, for joining us for Military Memoirs. The preceding program was brought to you through the generous support of Agape Senior Center, providing quality senior health care from residential locations in Conway and Garden City and by Crestcom Bank, serving our community and our veterans with full-service banking and convenient locations. <laughs>